the middle of a series, we're actually in the third week of a four-week series called Let's Talk To, and this is a sermon series specifically about mental health. Again, for those of you who weren't here last year for part of this series, or for this series, we did a Let's Talk One, and this is the sequel to that, only because we feel like we opened the door a crack a little bit, or maybe opened the door a lot last year, but it really just kind of opened some things up for us and brought us on a path of healing. And we thought, hey, you know what, this year, what we should do is we should just kind of continue the journey a little bit. And so it's not like going to the well again. It's really just about, hey, uh, is there some more things here that we can uncover uh, that the Lord wants to lead us through? And so that's why we're doing this series about mental health. Of course, the, the, uh, the world, uh, you know, in culture, they're talking all about this, and it's just a huge topic right now. And so I think, you know, given that, we should be talking about it as well, and uh, we should be kind of opening up this conversation in church. First week, we talked about having the full range of emotions, that at church, it's, you don't only have to be happy, you know, or, or confident or hopeful. You know, you can have the full range of emotions as a Christian. We showed all those in Jesus. Last week, how many people uh, really appreciated Dr. Grant Mullen? Wasn't that fantastic? Just uh, clap. I know he's not here, but we can clap. Uh, again, I said it in the intro. I'll say it again. I've heard the guy. I think that was my fifth time. And every time I hear it, I just kind of grab something new, and it just kind of, it just kind of solidifies in my spirit. And so this uh, week, I want to share a personal story. He got to the end, and here's where we're actually going to end up. Um, He asked this question, and this is the question that he left us with. Will you give God permission to remove your baggage? Will you give God permission to remove your baggage? And uh, I want to tell you my story because I was at a similar point where somebody asked me and said, will you give God permission to remove your baggage? And you know what? I said yes. I said yes to that. And I'm going to tell you my story in just a few moments about what God did in that moment as soon as I gave him permission, as soon as I crossed that threshold. Um, Here's the verse that I want to go through. And actually, my wife, Carolyn, will probably use this verse next week as well because she's speaking next week. And she's going to give us some practical tools on how to actually discipline your mind to, uh, you know, to, to be able to do what the, the back half of this verse says. But the verse says, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says, The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So I called this sermon the weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Because at our disposal in the spiritual realm and through the power of God, we have weapons of mass destruction. And we can break these strongholds that are in our life. So it goes on to say, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. And so my wife, Carolyn, is going to talk next week about how to take every thought captive. And some people find this very, very difficult, but we're going to talk about that next week. And it's going to be extremely practical and extremely helpful. If you've heard this verse, but you need some tools, and you're kind of like, well, I get the concept, but help me to the next leg of the journey. And she's got a fantastic, um, she's going to lead us in in a great way next week. Let me just back up, though, and recap Three things from what uh, Dr. Mullen said. These are three things that I took from his message. And you may have taken some other things, but I'm going to use these as the leaping point to move into the the, the talk that I want to give today. The first thing is this. Uh, The first thing he said is that transformation is possible. Remember he gave the verse Romans 12, 1 and 2, or actually it was just 2. And he said, you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can, be, you can actually be transformed. And so all of a sudden it dawned on him at one moment that you could actually be more than saved. You could be both saved and transformed into somebody brand new. And so this was, revel- this was like, what? I thought it was just kind of like, you know, you do, the, you do the communion thing, you get baptized, and then it's kind of like, okay, well now I just suffer like I was suffering before. No, there is like saved and transformed. And so he, he made a great point about that. And he talked about, and he was asking about how, which kind of led him into the rest of his talk. And then he talked about something that I think is revolutionary, especially when it comes to Christian mental health. And he gave this little diagram, and he had three converging circles. And he talked about three different parts to ourselves. As people, we have three parts. We have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. And as it pertains to our mental health, 
uh, these three components, you can't take one out, you can't take two out, and you can't focus on only one. They're connected. And God has made us that way. And so he, again, went into great depths and talked about salvation. You know, during salvation, the body, uh, you know, doesn't really change a whole lot during salvation. Uh, the spirit, actually, it's a transaction. And your, your, your spirit, actually, uh, it gets moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. But the, and then the soul, the soul also, as part of us, it's a whole part of us, a, a whole part of us. But when, when the soul gets saved, he made great points to say, when you become saved, it doesn't remove all of the baggage. It doesn't remove the baggage of your past. It doesn't remove the, you know, the, the wound that you got when you were five, or the wound that you got when you were eight, or the abuse that you suffered in your past. It doesn't remove all that. You're saved, but it doesn't remove all that. And he wants to, God wants you to be more than saved. He wants you to be saved and transformed. And so in a nutshell, that is, that is what he was, he was talking about. Now, in terms of mental health, it's important to note that there are three other things. So with the body, there can be things that are called chemical imbalances, mood disorders, and things that in your brain, in the actual makeup of your brain, cause you to not be able to take every thought captive. For instance, somebody with ADD. They can't focus long enough to actually take every thought captive. So the Bible says, I'm supposed to take every thought captive, but the mental capacity in their mind, they can't focus on anything, let alone take a thought captive. And so you see that there's actual physical reason why there's a mental health issue. And so if there's a physical mental health issue, that doesn't mean, and this is what he was alluding to, we'll just read your Bible and pray more. Well, that doesn't help somebody with ADD. They actually need something chemically to change, alter the physical nature. And then he, he um, alluded to the fact that we all wear eyewear. Or those of us who are over 40. I am in denial. I'm in denial, big time. When I read this stuff up here, man, I'm glad I have some of it memorized. Because it's just like... <laughs> the Rob Sharp version is coming out. But mood disorders are the same. Mood disorders are the same. So we have technology and we have medication and we can take those medications and we can actually cause the brain, we can alter the brain in such a way that we can actually get to the point where now we can take every thought captive, you know? And so that's not wrong. That's one component. Remember, we have to have comprehensive. We have to have all three components. Then there's also the spiritual component. And get this, and he said this a couple times, that Satan hates your guts. Now, I'm not sure about that, but the, but the Bible says that the enemy comes to what? Shout it out. Steal, kill, and destroy. There is an enemy of your soul, and he's trying to take you down. And so any of those thoughts that are in there or any of those things that are upset, he's going to actually manipulate those to cause you to go into the ditch. And you wonder, how did I get here? I don't want to be in the ditch. Well, Satan is actually pushing you into the ditch, and spiritually, you have to push back against that. Right? And that's what, in the spirit realm, man, we have so much power you know, it's not, a, it's not a medication, but the power of Scripture, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of community, the power of worship keeps us mentally healthy. And that's what he talked about. Then there's the third thing, which is the soul. And the soul is this place where we have to deal with the wounds from the past and we have to deal with emotional baggage and sometimes we have to deal with unforgiveness. This is not a, the spirit part and it's not the body part. These, this is the soul part. And he defined uh, the soul as your mind, will, and emotions. And so in your mind, will, and emotions, you know, you can willingly hold back forgiveness. When you willingly hold back forgiveness, that makes you bitter inside. That makes you just die a little bit each day as you don't forgive, as you don't work through the process of forgiving, right? As you hold on to the baggage of, the, of your past and live in denial and say, I'm going to pretend that that doesn't exist. I'm just going to live in the body. I'm going to exercise, eat right, and I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pray and then you have all of this baggage. Remember, he showed us a great graphic of, you know, this Christian who had the Christian jacket on and had his Bible, but this big, huge bag of baggage. All of this junk, all of this mind clutter, all of this soul clutter, all of these memories and events that will hinder you from moving forward, hinder you from being mentally 
healthy. He used this, this, uh, this term uh, in childhood. Sometimes there can be an earthquake in your personality. An earthquake in your personality. And some, some of you in here had great upbringings. Some of you guys had you know, fantastic parents and it was leave it to beaver. You know, it was just perfect and it was great. And so you've kind of come through and, and you're healthy and you're whole and, and you don't get how somebody else could have a wound or a scar from the past. But it happens all the time. And I would say probably 80% of the people in here, there was something that happened in your past that is uh, going on in your head or is underlying scripts in your life and you're not willing to kind of look back. You don't want to dig into that baggage. Who does? But those things have created an earthquake in your personality. And, and it's not necessarily that the event happened. Here's what happens in the event. If you mix the spirit in with it, all of a sudden Satan, and this is what, what uh, Dr. Mullen said, Satan begins to whisper in your heart the conclusion that you're supposed to make about those events. So my father abused me. That means... I'm worthless. That's the conclusion. My father abused me. That means I'm junk. My father abused me. That means I'm no good. My father abused me. That means it's the conclusion. It's the lie. I have no future because my father abused me. I remain stuck. I remain stuck. Until you unearth that baggage, like he said, there's an excavation of your soul. You unearth that baggage. You take it out. You look at it. And you let God... Redefine what that was. It wasn't your fault. It actually had nothing to do with you at all. You just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Really, what it talks more about is the abuser, not the abused. And so God can then start to heal you and start to move you past all of these things. But that whole bit right there is what we in biblical terms or in theological terms would be, would be called a stronghold. A stronghold in your life. Let's go back to the scripture. So the weapons that we fight with, and we're going to arm ourselves with some weapons this morning, with weapons that we fight with, uh, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You can crush these lies of the enemy. You can crush them. If they're wounds, the wounds can be actually healed. And I'm going to give you a story about that firsthand in just a second. These wounds can be healed. Why? Because God has given us, through Jesus, divine power to do that. We just have to be willing to actually look at the junk, pull it up before God, and work our way through the junk and the baggage of the past. But you have to give him permission. You have to give him permission. And that's hard. Because the baggage sometimes is really tough to look at. You have to invite him into the process you have to recognize that you do have baggage because some of us live in denial, which is not just a river in Egypt. Right? We live in denial. I'm fine. I'm, I'm just going to make it through. I'll just, I'll just read Scripture more. I'll just pray more. No, there's, there's some work to be done. You can't separate the three. The three are all interconnected. The body and the spirit and the soul, and they all have to work together for you to be mentally whole. You know what? He's the first person that I've ever actually seen bring that all together, and I think it's fantastic. And so the third thing about this was, will you, God, will you give God permission? Let me show you this matrix, and I'll quickly move on through this. But I, I just want to show you exactly how this happens. I know I've described it a little bit, but I want to show you exactly how this happens. So go through this. Okay, so there was abuse in your past. Let's go to this. So the first thing that happens, say you're six years old, and all of a sudden there was an abuser in your life, and he abused you, and it creates a wound immediately in that point. Now we talked about this, that the conclusions you make about this abuse can cause a stronghold, and those strongholds are this. The next thing is lies. So these are the lies we believe. These are the conclusions that we make about the event that happened. So the event was just atypical or whatever. It would just kind of stood on its own. It was horrendous. If it was abuse, it was horrendous. But then we start to actually calculate through and start to make equations and say, this is exactly who I am. It defines me as a person. And, and you know what? You don't have a whole lot of control over this. This is just the way it happens. Unless somebody is there in the moment to help you define what that event actually was, and who you are to be going forward, it's really tough to kind of struggle through that stuff. 
on your own. That's why we need community. So then what happens is this. Emotional upheaval. Because when you start to feel those lies, right? It doesn't feel too good. I'm worthless. I'm no good. I have no future. It's hopeless. You start to to feel those things. And so you start to feel some internal, and this may even be subconscious. This may be subconscious, but in your mind, you start to feel pain. You start to feel emotional pain. And so what do you do if you have a headache? Or what do you do if you have a broken arm? Or what do you do if you have a bad back? What do you do? You take painkiller, right? And so what we have here as painkiller is dysfunctional behavior. Because most of the dysfunctional behaviors, when your brain starts to react, it it creates this thing called cortisol, which is this, you know, chemical in your brain that causes pain and stress. When you're stressed, it's cortisol that you're feeling. And so what you need, usually on top of that to, to trumpet, is this thing called dopamine. Well, dopamine will help you actually feel really good, especially in large doses, So that's why people who are abused all of a sudden start to go to the casino because when I'm at the casino and I'm playing that slot machine and they don't have these anymore, they just press a button. Not that I know that, but (laughs) just saying. But when I can just kind of fix my mind on three cherries, three sevens, keep the money going in, all of a sudden I don't feel the pain. Or I become sexually promiscuous. If I'm sexually promiscuous, the dopamine of the new romance and the whole, all of that stuff, all of a sudden there's no pain anymore. I can, I can start to drink. And when I drink, sure, I feel terrible in the morning, but in the moment, I don't feel any of that emotional pain and so forth. Dysfunctional behavior. Sometimes this is anger. Sometimes this is broken relationships. And you can't keep a relationship because you destroy everything in your path because you have all this pain going on inside. You're dying inside. And you need to look at the baggage. And so what this does is it leads to a life situation. If you're uh, getting your dopamine through um, eating, then you become obese if you, or, you, or you become anorexic. If you, uh, you know, are trying to kill it through gambling, all of a sudden you have a bunch of debt to pay. Or shopping, all of a sudden you have huge Visa card bills, right? If it's drug addiction, it's like, you know, there's a lot of side effects for drug addiction. Alcohol abuse, we see it all over. People are in pain. And they start to mask it with these painkillers and it brings us into this life situation. So the idea here is how to actually reverse this. And just let me actually notice one thing here. Uh, In the church, what we usually look at are two things and not five things. When we judge somebody for drinking too much or eating too much or being promiscuous, we look at the top two and we judge them on the top two. Right? We look at them and go, did you see them? Did you see how they were acting? And we become judgmental because that's not our pain. You know, our pain isn't food. Their pain is food. Do you see what they're doing to their body? Do you see, you know, they're out of control. And we judge them. The beauty of Jesus is that Jesus always, always, always didn't judge on that and went straight to the wound. Zacchaeus, why are you, why are you ripping people off? Woman at the well, where are your accusers? Go and sin no more. You got a new life going on. Woman at the well, I will look you in the eye and I will show you respect as a human being, even though everybody else is calling you every name in the book. And Jesus could go to the wound without judgment and then lead them on a path of healing. And I love that. And so maybe you can think about that as you're going forward. Just, just a couple of, couple of scripture, and then I, I'll tell you my story. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And sometimes we can't see our way, we don't know what truth is, and we don't feel any life. Our life is actually pretty, destruct, pretty destroyed. And Jesus said in John, 3, uh, John 8, 32, that you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth will set you free. So the truth of the, about that event will actually make you free. I experienced that. I experienced that. John 10.10 10 said, as much as the thief's purpose or our enemy's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy, I have come. My purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. Healthy. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be thriving. 
I want you to be clicking along. I want you to be cooking with gas. Jesus. So in where all of this came together for me, is I had, I had a, a point. I had a point in my life where I could actually look into my baggage. And as much as I didn't want to, I was part of this um, conference that happened in Ohio, and it was beautiful that it was kind of a way I could remain anonymous. And uh, there were a number of things that happened for me in this kind of conference that happened over about an 18-month period, seven different uh, retreats. And, uh, and I started to look at my baggage. I started to look at the things of my past. I started to look at the wounds of my past as this kind of structure for safety and for healing was, was set up. So let me take you way back to the beginning of my family. So in the, in the 1960s, early 1960s, my mom and my dad got together. World wind romance, you know, all the birdies and stars and bells and whistles. Um, they decided, they came together decided to start a family. They decided early on that the perfect family for them was to have two boys and two girls. And so by 1967, their dreams were completely fulfilled. They had my older brother Steve, my next older brother Ken, and then Kathy came along in 1965, and then 1967, last time the Leafs won the Stanley Cup until this year, uh, 67, was my sister Donna. Perfect family. Everything was in place. However, there were some stresses in the family. And of course, if you know and you have four kids, you know how stressful a family can be and how busy a family can be and all of the resident things that come your way. And then all of a sudden in 1970, May 28th, guess who appeared on the world stage? And my mother was an amazing mother. She was an amazing woman. And to this day, probably the most inspiring person in my life that I know of because I watched her struggle. But in that mixture of stress, in that mixture of my mom struggled with mental health issues. She struggled with chronic depression that was undiagnosed. And she was never given any due for that. She medicated herself and self-medicated for years and years, and her life was cut short as a result of it. But in this mixture of this busy house and this mental health issues and a struggling marriage and four busy kids, the last thing on her mind, the last thing that she wanted was to be pregnant. And if you're a mom in this room, you know, because it's not an easy, for the guys, it's an easy thing. Nine months, you're just like, yeah, okay, just let me know when the delivery is. Right? For guys, but for women, that changes. That's a game changer. And so that's what was going through my mother's mind. And I don't understand all this. I've researched it a little bit, but if you know anything about um, biology and especially human biology, there's this thing called the hippocampus in your brain. It's an emotional center and it regulates emotions and it's associated with memory. There's also this thing called the amygdala. And when you mix together, they actually have found that people in utero have memories from in utero. And now you can debate that or research it or do whatever you want with it. Here's my deal. I have this picture of my mother and I don't know where it came from. It's in my mind. It plays in my mind. It's, can, I can envision it even right now as I'm talking to you. It's this picture. If you can picture a film noir where it's like, you know, it's black and white. It's this upshot of these stairs. And it's kind of almost animated because it's so stark in its nature. And my mother in her arms is holding a bundle. And the bundle is me. It's a little baby. It's an infant. It's a tiny, it's just out of the hospital baby. And in the moment in my memory, she throws me down the stairs. And I believe that that is connected specifically, and you can debate me all day long if you want to, but I believe that's connected to this memory of how I felt, that mixture of everything that was going on in the house. That's how I felt when my mother learned the news from the doctor or whether she, whatever, however she found out, the minute she heard, you're pregnant. She's like, I don't want to be pregnant. I already got four kids. I had the perfect family, and that's not going well. I don't need another straw to be added to the stack. This is the straw that's going to break the camel's back. And at a cellular level, I can actually feel that. I can actually feel that, even though I've never been pregnant. 
which might come to, as some surprise to some of you. Some people were noticing that I was pregnant this morning without knowing what the due date was. So, of course, there's, there's all of this going on. So there's all of my formative years, and then, of course, my brothers and sisters find out that I was an accident. Any other accidents in this room? I was, I was a mistake. I was an afterthought. I was not wanted. Come on, that's the truth. Mary Lou, and you can tell, you can tell the story because you got kids, man. You got kids. That's awesome. But my brothers and sisters didn't believe that. And of course, when you're a brother and sister, you just tease mercilessly and you don't, you don't care about the effects. And they were all older than me, and I loved them and respected them all. Not really. But, uh, you know, it was this whole attitude that Robbie needs help. Robbie can't do it on its own. Robbie was a mistake. Robbie wasn't wanted. We didn't really want Robbie here. And so if we go through this metrics that I showed, and you don't have to put it up there, Joe. This, this came out for me when the upheaval and the emotional upheaval came, even at a subconscious level. It came out as just wild behavior. And... Uh, I would probably challenge any kid in this church for the wildest kid in the church. Have you know. So focus, Ethan, I got you, man, I got you. Just focus your mind 30 years from now, Ethan, when you're a pastor and you're standing up in front of people and leading people in the ways of God. Amen? Right? But listen, I, in grade four, when all of the awards were being handed out for integrity and character and all of those things that we love, empathy and whatever, what did I get? I got a chocolate bar for being the class clown. And you know what? In that moment, I was getting an award because everybody thought I was funny. I was getting an award, but I walked up there and I was mortified because I wasn't doing it to get an award. I was doing it to mask pain. I was doing it to cover something up. I don't want somebody to shine a light on that. I don't want to be like this. You think I want to be like this? When I was in Crusaders, and you've heard this story before, and I think, Ruth, you know, we, we've made some connections about this before. At my church Crusader group, anybody been to Crusaders? I was kicked out. Mr. and Mrs. Sharp, please do not bring Robbie to Crusaders because he wrecks everything. <laughs> he is uncontrollable. We can't control this kid. He spends the entire time in the corner with the fire extinguisher, so, so just do us all a favor and make sure that he doesn't come back. When I was in grade nine, I was one of two students in grade nine who had a spare. And I saw my math teacher's forehead vein come out and he was screaming. He was trembling because I just frustrated him so much. And he said, sharp, and to my friend that was sitting with me, get out of my class and never come back. During my grade seven year, my desk was at the principal's office. I would have got an EA now, right? I would have had one-on-one, -on -one, so it would have been great. <laughs> hey, let's, let's go to a ball game. Let's, you know, let's cook some popcorn here. What can we do in this place? Back then, it was like, no, you have to go and sit with the principal all day long. My nickname was Little Office. Right? My brother's nickname was Big Office because he was a big, massive... If you ever met my brother, he's a massive guy. Not like me at all. And he also was at the, at the office. I was, I was just masking pain. I was just like, I was going six ways to Sunday. Nobody was giving me any script to go, here's what you're going through, and I'm going to help you define it. I'm going to help you define it. And so I was just in an incredible amount of emotional pain, and there was no support, there was no recognition, there was nothing going on, and this was my life. I went from the wound to the lie to the emotional people with the pain to the painkiller and then into the life situation. As I came into my teen years, I thought, you know what, summer school isn't that fun and you know, getting kicked out of any, everything is not that fun and I probably should think about getting a girl at some point along the way, so I should probably kind of figure some things out. So I made some adjustments with all of the anger and the emotional people that instead of being insignificant, instead of making trouble for anybody, I was going to swing to the other end of the spectrum and I was going to make my life count. I was going to make a difference in this world. I was going to play by the rules. I was going to do everything right, and I was going to go to Bible college, and I was going to turn the world around for Jesus. And I thought, if, if, 
If people think I'm insignificant and I don't matter and I was a mistake and I was not wanted, well, I will show them. I'm going to live a life of purpose. And that inspiration and all of that stuff will actually ease my pain. And I became performance-oriented. And I got into the ministry and I thought, if I'm just smart enough, if I'm just good enough, if I just do good enough things, then I can justify me taking up this square footage of geography in this world. Because I thought, you know what, I don't belong here. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. So all of that changed. All of that changed. On August 22nd, it was a Wednesday, it was in 2007. And the date will be super specific in just a second. But as I worked through Bible college and I started my first church and things went really, really well at the first church and then I got sort of a promotion, went to the next church and it was a larger church and I had this really you know, great profile and it was all awesome until the whole thing went toxic and I was dying a thousand deaths. And although I was performing every single week, inside me there was nothing I had nothing spiritually to give. I had nothing that of any kind of substance to give, even though I was leading people in worship and leading hundreds of people in worship on a Sunday morning. And inside, I was dying, and I couldn't figure it out, and I couldn't figure out why my relationships were so toxic. Because all I was doing was pushing the gas pedal of this performance mentality. And so in 2006, I decided enough was enough, and I left the ministry. I said, I can't do this. And you can call it burnout or you can call it whatever you want. But literally, I was just on my last nerve and I couldn't take it anymore. And so I left the ministry. And if you were here when David Shepard was here and I talked at great lengths about what an influence, it was in that moment where I met David Shepard for real. And he just came in and he came alongside me and he started to walk in the journey with me. But if you remember this conference that I was a part of back in, in Ohio, They had this thing called formational prayer counseling. And so my wife and I actually decided that we would go away on this retreat. And so we went away on this retreat, and I got all this emotional pain and all this baggage, and I just left the ministry, and now what is my life equating to? And you know what, now I'm a failure, and nobody's ever going to hire me again, and this is just a disaster, and I don't know what to do. I don't even know if I want to serve God anymore, because I don't know what I believe. And it was a crisis moment. And I'm just like, I, I'm just really struggling here on every single one of these levels. I am dying here. And I love that the Lord walks with us in our journey. Because he, even though I was feeling all those things, he was walking with me step for step. All the way into this retreat that my wife and I go to. And so in that retreat, they start asking those questions that we've been asking. Are you willing to invite God in? Are you willing to give God permission to help you deal with your baggage? Are you, are you okay to not live in denial anymore? Can you step into that? And so in the safety of that moment and with all of this stuff that was going on, I decided I would. So it was a Wednesday night and the, the program started on Sunday and we laugh at this because when I signed us up for this retreat, I thought it was one of those kind of sit by the pool with a cold drink type of retreat. You know, this is the, pe- the picture they painted for me. So I, you know, ex- you know, pictured us just kind of like resting and relaxing and refreshing ourselves. Little did I know that they were going to go li- deep into my soul and pull out half of this junk and Jesus was going to deal with it. And so we did the Sunday night and we did the Monday and we did the Tuesday and by the Wednesday it was a crisis moment and I thought, I don't even know what's going on. I'm I'm dying here. I'm trying to look at this baggage. I don't really know what to make of any of it. Struggling with this, you're not worthy. Struggling with this, your life doesn't matter. Struggling with this, you're not wanted. Struggling with this, you're a mistake. And believing it. And this guy came up behind me. His name was Mark Ongley. And he said, hey man, what's, what's going on? So I kind of told him my, my little sob story that I just told you what was going on inside of me and creating all this turmoil and pain. And he said, would you, would you mind if I pray with you? I said, of course, we're at a prayer retreat, duh. <laughs> Bring it on, brother. That's what you're here for. So he, he puts his hand on my back, and this is probably the most remarkable moment in my entire life of a spiritual nature. He puts his hand on my back. And of course, it's all about visualization and kind of linking in the spirit and reflecting and contemplative and all that stuff. 
And so he puts his hand on my back. And before he utters the words, I, I see something, but he, then he utters the words, do you see anything? Because it was all, you know, this visualization type prayer and just soaking the spirit. But, but I see it. And I, I hesitate for a minute because I'm like, this is kind of surprising. It happened way too quick. Am I conjuring this? What? It was just automatic. It was immediate. But I didn't know what it was. No idea. And so he says, do you see anything? And I'm like, I actually kind of do. Like, I do see something. It's like, okay. Like, and of course, it's super long, right? Quiet music's playing, candles are lit. Uh, do you want to tell me what it is? And I, I said, it's, it's a circle. It's a circle. And he goes, okay. We're waiting on the Spirit. We're waiting on the Spirit. Do you, do you have any idea what the circle means or what the circle is? And in that moment, I had to kind of make a decision because I knew what it was the minute I looked at it. Just like my vision of my mom throwing me down the stairs, which I can conjure in my mind. It's a memory. Never happened, but it's a memory in my mind. In this moment, he puts his hand on my back. Do you see anything? Yes, I see a circle instantaneously. And I knew what it was. It was a cell. It was a one-celled human organism. And so I said, I, I think it's a cell. I think it's when you know sperm and egg come together and however the miracle of life happens and in that moment, I've even learned the term, it's called a zygote. In that moment, there's a zygote where, where the, the DNA come together and the chromosomes come together and all of a sudden it's not sperm and egg and it didn't exist before, but in that moment it comes together and boom, there's a cell. <laughs> And I said, that, it's a cell. And I started to get kind of excited. And so we're waiting in the Spirit, we're waiting in the Spirit. And he says, what's it doing? What's, what's happening now? Do you see anything more? And I see the cell do this. And it divides. And I'm like, it just divided. And he goes, and, 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 okay. and so again, this is over minutes. Okay, what happened? And it divides again. And it divides again. And I said, you know what? I think God is showing me my conception. This is bizarre, I know. But for me, it was so impactful. And he says, what is the feeling you're having? Or what are you hearing from the Spirit of the Lord in this moment? And I said, every time the cell divides, the Lord is saying, I love you. It divides again, I love you. It divides again, I love you. And all of a sudden, my life, the beginning of my life, which my mother did not want, which I had believed for 37 years, all of a sudden had brand new meaning and brand new purpose because of that moment. And I was moved to tears. It blew my mind. Now, I do have to say this, that I had never, so my math teacher and my science teacher we're the same guy. So even though I went to science, like I went from having like a 51 to maybe a 39 to a, I think I had a 21 in my last, we had trimesters back then. So he passed me with a 21 in science. I never took science again. I never saw what a cell looked like, ever. I have no recollection of this. I didn't look through a book. I didn't go on the internet. Prior to the prayer time, the Lord God himself, who actually created this whole mechanism, by the way, literally showed me in a prayerful moment to heal my soul when I was willing to look at my baggage. He trumped the beliefs that I had about my conception and about the fact that I wasn't wanted and about the fact that I was a mistake and all of those things. And the Lord showed me a vision of something that I had never seen before. When I went home from this moment, and again, this is 2007, so the internet wasn't quite as fancy as it, is, as it is today, I looked up a cell, and I'm like, that's exactly what I saw in a prayerful moment. I'm like, are you kidding me? How is it possible that the Lord could show me this movie in my mind in this prayer state? And through the beauty of science and through the beauty of video, I want to show you exactly what conception looks like. So Josiah's got a video that he's going to, 
Hello, this is Dr. Tierney, and today I want to talk to you about a video image of an embryo uh, developing up to five days. And what you see here is the egg, and we're looking at what's called an embryoscope that's videoing the fertilization of the egg uh, and cell division to become an embryo. Now, the embryoscope is quite a new technique. Uh, it's been around for a couple of years and we can actually video the embryo over the next five days and what you're just seeing now is cell division uh, of the fertilized egg into two separate cells. So this is the beginning of cell division and now we can see this is about two days old this embryo it's divided into four cells. This is the outer egg shell called the zona pellucida, this thick cell structure here is the zona pellucida of the egg and again you can see further cell division. This is occurring about three days. So it's a three day old embryo now. You can see the cells are looking very even and so far this is a nice looking embryo. It's developing nicely. So this develops Soon to the point where it actually after gets multiple to multiple cell divisions that the embryo is going uh, to start attached to the mother's womb. So Joe, could you just stop it and bring and it it's back? It's just starting to do this now. And I want to read you something from somebody who was also a youngest Hello, this is in their family. All right. So I'm going to read this. I'm going to read this while we show this video, and Barry's going to actually mute the mute the audio, and you will recognize this writer and this writing. Go ahead. And this is what I heard. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. Knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. And every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And so when I saw this, thanks Joe, you can turn it off. I mean, outside of the fact that that's just amazing science, right? Like that is just incredible. And it's incredible that that happens and incredible that they can actually videotape that. Unbelievable. But God wanted to tell me, you're not an accident, bro. You're not a mistake. You're, you were wanted. Your mom didn't want you, but I, the God of the universe, wanted you because you know what? I got something for you to do. I got some people for you to touch. I got this purpose, and it's awesome. And you don't have to perform, and you don't have to spin plates. And you don't have to think that your life is worthless and nothing. But I, the God of the universe, am going to decide that that little cell, the, the width of a hair, is going to happen. And in that moment, I'm going to smile. And in that moment, I'm going to tell you that I love you. I'm going to tell you, you got a bright future, bro, because even though your mom doesn't want you, and even though your, your brothers and sisters are going to tease you mercilessly, mercilessly, they have no idea what I'm going to do in you and through you. And I, I can't tell you. I mean, some of you are looking at me like I'm cockeyed, and some of you are looking at me like I'm, you know, this is just the weirdest story I ever heard. It gets weirder because I'm going to tell you another bit. Isn't it amazing that the God of the cosmos will settle in on somebody who's just struggling through life because they have a bit of an identi identity crisis. They got some baggage going on that's holding them back, and God goes, oh, I'm going to help that guy. I'm going to show him a picture of a cell. I am going to heal the wound. And I'll tell you, from that point forward, my life has been completely different. My life has been 100% different. I don't feel insecurity anymore. I don't feel inferiority anymore because I know God's got my back. God's got me. Now to top it all off, and as much as you thought maybe I was crazy up to this point, 
when I got home, it was really difficult because that was like kind of the climax of the week, and then we kind of figured some other stuff out, and it was just a really hard week. But spiritually, we prayed more than we ever prayed before, and we were more in tune than we ever were before. But then Monday hits. So you go back to work Monday, and I had this whole thing about praying in the Spirit and visualizing, and so God was showing me all kinds of stuff. Like, just blow your mind stuff, awesome stuff. There's a place in the Spirit that I was in that I had never been to before and that haven't been to since. And God was just alive in me, and my mind was working, and my soul was, was unearthed, and there was no crap in there. And I was, just, I, was just on, I was just cooking with gas. It was awesome. And then the Lord blew my mind. The Lord blew my mind. Because I realized, I realized that as much as every person has a birthday, we all have a birthday. There was a day when we arrived on the planet. Mine was May 28, 1970. I all of a sudden realized, because of this whole vision and all of this stuff, that we also all have a conception day. Right? We all have a conception day. We don't know when it is. Our parents don't even know when it is. They can kind of like, oh, okay, we're about this week, this far along, and blah, 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 blah. But we don't know. But, but God knows. But God knows our conception day. Right? We just read from David. So as I'm driving, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking about all this stuff, I'm like, wait a second. August 22nd, 2007. I wonder... I wonder what you would do if you went 40 weeks from Wednesday, August 22nd, 2007 to May 28th, 2008. And so I had a flip phone. Flip out my phone. Remember it had a calendar on it and it was like the most ugly thing ever? I got to August 22nd and I started counting. One, two, three, four, five. All the way to 40 And that conception day, that prayer day, that hand on the back, that vision that I had never seen before of a cell, everything coming together, I love you, I love you, I love you, you have a purpose, you have a purpose, you have a purpose. All of a sudden, it lands on May 28th. My birthday. God was saying to me, hey, guess what? I am reconceiving you. I am reconceiving you. There is a brand new start in your heart and life. And from that moment till this, you know what? I was out of the ministry back then. I was working in a secular job. I worked my way through all this. I prayed through some stuff. My wife and I worked through some stuff. And you know what? I'm here today because there's a God of the cosmos who's interested in healing your baggage. And when Grant speaks, my heart palpitates because I get exactly what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. When Joanne Goodwin gets up here and I feel her pain, but I know, I know that I know there, there's life on the other side. There's healing to be had and God will put a dynamite stick in that concrete of that lie that you've believed for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. God will blow that to bits if you will let him deal with your baggage. Now, as much as I had this experience, I really believe that there were times going back a number of years when we used to have altar time. Remember altar time? And we would come to the altar, and you'd come to the altar, and you'd cry and bawl and all this kind of stuff. And maybe you wouldn't see pictures of embryos, but you would, you would literally, you would have a, an encounter with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And in that moment, Joanne Goodman said it, Joanne Goodwin said it best. She said, you know what? Uh, I had 20 years of counseling just because I just kept going to church every week. And so all of a sudden, my baggage started to lighten. And then she had her experience with the Lord. But I think that's what happens. And it happens in the presence of the the Lord. And so when you can mix your your body, your geographical, and you can put yourself in a place where I'm going to quiet myself before the Lord. I'm going to quiet. I'm going to turn off my technology. I'm going to quiet the mood. I'm actually going to put myself physically in a place where I can hear from the Lord. And when you say spiritually, you know, God, I just want to open myself up to you and that spirit, all of a sudden that helps you to engage the soul, your mind, will, and person, your personality, your mind, and your will, and emotions. And those things can come together and God can move in that moment. So what do you take from this? as we talk about this series on mental health. I'm just telling you, there's a place in the spiritual realm that you can go to, that we can go to, where we'll find healing and we'll find restoration. 
and it's different from anything that you've ever known before. And I pray that we would go there. I pray that we would lean into that place. But it's kind of like an onion, right? It's like an onion. Onions have layers. And so we can't cut maybe right to the thing. This was months and months and months of prep for me, and then a night, and then a specific moment of prayer. Uh, it's like an onion. And I think last year, maybe we took that off that first layer of onion. And then this year, we can take off another layer of onion. And over the course of moving forward spiritually and seeking the Lord and all of that kind of stuff, we can get to the core and the root issues that are holding some of us back. Amen? Amen. So it's about three things, and this, with this I'm done. Um, John, can you come back, and we'll just sing Great Are Your Lord as people are coming out. But number one, it's this. It's this. Number one, it's, a, it's about creating a safe place. So for all of us, we need to not be judging everybody by life situation dysfunctional behaviors only. We need to recognize that everybody in this room has a wound. Everybody in this room is carrying around something that has hurt them in the past, something that's hindering them. And we need to start operating with grace and love and just go, I don't even know your baggage. I, don't, I know you got some, but I don't know what it is, but I'm going to love you. I just want this to be a place where you can find the grace and the truth of God. Safe place. And it's about waiting and listening to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes, you know, people complain to me, oh, we don't have altars, you know, like we used to. And then I realized that the altar in the church service was about a 10 to 15 minute window in the week where we expected God to move. And then I realized, hey, you know what? It's up to all of us to have personal altar time, isn't it? And I think God can do just as much in those personal altar times as he does at these altars. And as the church begins to change or it continues to change, we need to find new ways of engaging the Holy Spirit if the altar time is a thing of the past. So I know a lot of people want to re, you know, bring that back, and I'm totally open to that. It just seems like the waves of the Spirit of the Lord aren't bringing us to, to those points. And so we may have to actually find and work at finding another way to encounter the Spirit of the Lord. So it's about creating a safe place. It's about listening and waiting on the Holy Spirit. And it's about giving God more space to work in your life. It's about giving him the permission that Grant talked about, Dr. Dr. Mullen talked about last week. It's about saying to the Lord, I give you permission to remove my baggage. One layer at a time, all the layers at a time, through that friend, through this friend, through that ministry, through this church, whatever the case may be, I want God to help me remove the baggage. So continue to give God permission to remove your baggage. Let's stand together.